Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you. Please be with my words as I speak, that they may be your words and they'll be a blessing to those here. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. This year, the theme for Pathfinders is what, Pathfinders? In the beginning, God. That's right. In the beginning, God. And it's, of course, all about creation. Amazingly, today, the fourth Saturday in October, is designated Creation Sabbath by our General Conference. The creationsabbath.net website has many great resources, including the sermon by Thomas Grove that I've adapted for us today. Fourteen years ago, I gave my first sermon about creation, and I've learned and studied a lot about the subject of creation and evolution and how important it is for Christians to understand the reality of creation. I'm so glad that you pathfinders and adventurers get to learn about God and his amazing creation. But not everyone appreciates the power of our creator God. The story is told that a group of scientists had a meeting and they decided that humans had come so far that they no longer needed God. After reaching their decision, they appointed one in their number to go and explain to God that he was no longer needed. The scientist said, God, we've concluded that we no longer need you because we are to this point that we can conceive life in a test tube and even clone people. So we are so technologically advanced that we can do many things that once were thought to be miraculous. So we are asking you to leave the world in our hands. God listened until the man was finished and with great kindness in his voice, he said, very well. But first, why don't we have a man-making contest? This sounded like a marvelous idea to the scientist and he agreed to the challenge, but God said, now you understand that we're gonna to have to do it the way that I did it back in the garden with Adam, right? The self-assured man said, that would be no problem. And the scientist bent down and grabbed a handful of dirt, realizing that in this handful, he held all the building blocks for life. But God looked at him and said, you don't understand. You have to get your own dirt. We as human beings have become so self-sufficient that we have forgotten where we have come from. We have theories about everything, even how the world began. One theory is that it all happened by chance, but that doesn't seem to measure up with the evidence we have. We are told that there are over 60 criteria that are necessary for life here on earth. There is a, here is a partial list of what is needed for life. The Earth's size, rotation, and distance from the sun are important. The size of the moon, oxygen, nitrogen, and even the ozone in our atmosphere are in just the right ratios. Even the physical properties of plain old water are critical for life. And the list goes on and on. Each of these criteria interlocks with others, and if any one of them were missing or changed, then life, the whole system would break down and life would be impossible. This is one of the reasons why I believe that this universe and the earth that we enjoy did not come into being by chance. But how did it come into being? Let's look at one of the most familiar passages in scripture that talks about how all this came to be. Genesis 1 verse 1, which was our scripture this morning, but we'll read it again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very succinct. Here we see a summary of what is going to be recorded in the rest of Genesis 1 and 2. It is also the foundation of everything else that goes on in scripture. So let's take a look at it word by word. In the beginning, scripture clearly shows that there was a beginning that life is not an endless cycle, that all of this began at a specific point in time. There are some out there who look at the creation stories as simply a myth, 
something that was made up by the ancients. But the Hebrew, Bereshith, says that there was indeed a beginning. When was this beginning? Many people have guessed at ages, but one man, Bishop James Usher of Ireland, studied the biblical chronologies and came up with a date, October 3, 4004 BC. Was he right? Probably not. There were some holes where he had to make some assumptions, and the Genesis account doesn't elaborate. It just tells us, in the beginning. In the beginning also tells us that this world, including humans, are, is not an accident. At some point in history, an infinite being decided to, and did, create this world. This world, you and I, are not accidents. We were purposefully created. Let's look at the next word. In the beginning, God. The word in Hebrew is Elohim, which is a very important word in the Bible. There are two main words that are used in the Old Testament for God. The one that we might be most familiar with is Yahweh, or Jehovah. It is the personal name of God. The other, which is the word used in this passage, is Elohim. An example of the difference between these two words is found here in the first two chapters of Genesis. The first chapter only uses the word Elohim for God. It talks about God speaking and there being light. It talks about God speaking and there being the sun, the moon, and the stars. It talks about God speaking and all the animals appearing. It even talks about God creating man, but it doesn't say how it was done. So God, Elohim, is a powerful God who speaks and gets things done. Then we go to chapter 2. There, the word for God changes from Elohim to Yahweh. All of a sudden, we see a much more personal God, a God who bends down in the dust and creates man, a God who created the Garden of Eden for man to live in, a God who sees that man is lonely and performs the first surgery to create a helpmate for Adam. So the fact that we see a powerful and personal God involved in the creation of the world immediately casts some doubt on the isms of the world. Atheism teaches that God doesn't exist, or at least his existence can't be proven. Pantheism teaches that God is in everything. Polytheism teaches that there are many gods. But the Bible tells us that an individual being, God himself, was the creator. We have seen that indeed there was a beginning, that this world was not an accident, and that there is a powerful and personal God responsible for the universe. That unimaginably powerful God did something amazing and unique, and it is the next word in our verse. In the beginning, God created. The verb bara in Hebrew is a very telling word. It is, the only, it is only ever used with God as the subject, which means that only God can create. Only God can create? But what about the great masterpieces of art? Weren't those created by the artist? What about the great culinary delights? Weren't they created by a chef? What about parents? Don't they create the child that they call their own? You see, Many times we use the words create and make interchangeably, but in reality they aren't interchangeable, at least not in the Bible. The Bible makes it very clear that only God can bara or create. But what's the difference? Notice what God did. He created something out of nothing. He spoke and there was light. He didn't take a wire and hook it up to some great generator in the sky and then flip a light switch to turn it on. No, he created light where there was no light. He created it out of nothing. He spoke and the birds and the fish came into being. He didn't have an incubator somewhere and transfer the eggs and make the fish and birds that way. No, he made something out of nothing. Like the story of the scientist, we humans can make all kinds of things with the materials that already exist. 
but we can never create something out of nothing like God can. He's the only being in the universe who can speak and something comes into existence. The only being who can make something out of nothing. A being who spoke and the trees appeared. A being who spoke and water appeared. A being who spoke and the sky appeared. The kind, that kind of being deserves to be worshiped because he is the one and only creator God. And we come here each Sabbath to worship that God. So far, we have seen that this world was not an accident. We have seen the powerful and personal God who is responsible for the whole universe. And we have seen a creator who, unlike any other being in the universe, can make things out of nothing. Let's move on to the final words in the verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As we look in the microscope, every little thing we see, God created. As we look up into the night sky with a telescope, every star and planet we see, God created. As we look around us today at all of the people around you, God created them and he created all of this. And he is the giving you and me as humans the responsibility to take care of and of course enjoy all the things that he created. It was all perfect at the end of that sixth day of creation. As he prepared to rest, God said, it is very good. He had created everything, even man and woman, with whom he could now have a relationship. But then something happened. Something went wrong. Somewhere down the line, the man and woman sinned. And because of this sin, his creation was marred. All of a sudden, death came in and the things he created began to die, even the humans. But God would not allow this to go unchallenged. He put a plan into action that he had made even before he started creating. He would come to earth himself and save humanity by dying. It would be a big risk, but God was willing to pay the price to stop sin and death from going on forever. The Apostle John describes it this way, in John chapter 1, uh, we'll read John 1, 1 through 4, and 10 and 12. 10 through 12. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Continuing in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He, created, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. God himself came to this earth to put a stop to sin and death. And so the word, the creator himself, Jesus Christ came to live among us, and then he died to stop the cycle of sin and death. But it isn't over yet. God's creation is still damaged. But one day, all of that will change. The same Apostle John who described Jesus as being the creator in the beginning, he also tells us what Jesus will do in the end. In Revelation 22, verse 12 and 13. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Because Jesus came and stops the cycle of sin and death, he can promise that one day it will all end. One day he will come back. One day sin, death, and suffering will end. And one day, God's creation will be recreated as a new heaven and a new earth, never again to be marred by sin or death. We can't even start to imagine how beautiful that is going to be. Let's plan to be a part of this earth made new. Won't you join me in prayer to tell our creator that you want to be part of his great recreation? Let's pray. 
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the amazing things you've done. This creation, all of us, we wouldn't be here without it. So we thank you for the creation you've made, the things you made for us to enjoy, and the fact that you had a plan even before sin came to rescue us. So we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice so that we can be made new to go to heaven with you. Please accept us, help us to choose each day to walk with you. And I pray that these pathfinders and adventurers will choose as well to follow you each and every day. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.